Hey guys, how's it going today? Wow, what a day in the markets again here today. We saw the markets, the indices just get crushed. We saw the Dow Jones, it was down over 800 and some points. We saw some other indices just get crushed as well. So I thought this was a good time to examine what's going on, like what's happening in the market, what are the reasons behind this? Um, we can explain some of them. You can never fully explain what's going on in the stock market, of course, right? It's all up in, to interpretation. Um, but I'd like to explain some of the things that are going on and then give you some recommendation and at the very end, you know, kind of give you my opinion and kind of give you some, you know, some insight as to what I think about the whole situation, what I think about investing in general. Um, so stay tuned for that. So market crash, a lot of people are talking that the stock market crash is finally coming. Uh, we've seen some notable things happen that have made a difference. Now, the biggest thing I think in my mind is the Fed raises, right? We've seen the Federal Reserve in the United States raising, raising, raising. I believe they're going to be raising one more time this year. Then they're going to be raising another three times uh, next year. So the ten-year, um, the ten-year note is something like three point two, three point three percent, or something. Historically speaking, it's getting pretty high. So if you're not too aware of this, the, the significance of this is that you know there's a lot of implications to it. But one of the the biggest implications is that you know if people are putting money into the stock market and maybe they're getting, you know, expecting ten percent or they're expecting a dividend of. I don't know, one and a half, two percent, three percent. You know, why would you do that when you can go risk free and put it into like, you know, a government bond or something like that? So that eats a lot of it as well. There's also some expectations as to what's going to be happening with the economy. You know, is the government trying to cool it down? Is this the end of the business cycle, right? Because the economy, as we know, you know, can go in cycles over long periods of time. You know, you, you'll see it, you know, you know, it rising up to a peak, 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 and then we'll see a recession, then it climbs. So generally speaking, you know, it goes up and up and down. But sometimes we see like an 08, just a huge decline. And that's what people are always afraid of, right? This is kind of related to the yield curve, you know. I don't like to reference the yield curve too much because it is debatable. But it's something that should be kept um, in mind as to what's going on. So if we race this right here, what the yield curve is, if you're unaware, is it's bonds, right? It's government bonds. So the yield curve usually looks something like this. So on this axis here, we're gonna have uh, the coupon rate or the percentage that you get. And then here we're gonna have the time. So this is time to maturity. If you're, if you're not aware of what a bond is, go back and watch my other video. I'll put a link to that right now. And I explain what a bond is. But usually the yield curve will look something like this. We're not gonna get too much into detail into the yield curve. So shorter time periods, you know, you're going to have a lower interest rate. So say people look at like the two year and the 10 year, and they call this a spread. Uh, that's another thing that some people look at. And generally speaking, the two year is going to have a less, you know, going to have less of a, uh, a coupon rate or a percentage you're going to make on your money than the 10 year. Well, you might ask, well, why is that? Well, there's, there's always a cost associated with holding your money for a long period of time. You know, what about if the government, you know, issues more bonds with a higher rate? Now you're stuck for 10 years, right? So that's generally how it goes. So you quite often now you're hearing flattening, let's put it down here, flattening of the yield curve. So this is concerning for a lot of investors. We'll say this is 10 years again, this is percentage, and this is time. It could keep shifting. And we've seen it kind of shifting, and that's what's been spooking the market right now, what we've been seeing, right? It's still not flat, but the concern is that it might go flat or it might even go inverted. Now, one of the reasons, I mean, there's many theories behind all this, and do I believe it, that this is very indicative? It is quite indicative in some cases of a recession coming, but, you know, it's not 100% or anything like that. But, one of, you know, one of the theories is that people are buying long-term bonds, right? So that's driving the price up, and then thus, the yield is going down. So you might ask yourself, well, why would someone, you know, take the same percentage, say it's 3% for a two year or a 10 year. Well, there's some assumptions here. There's some assumptions that perhaps maybe the economy is not going to, um, it's not going to function as good as it's functioning right now. Perhaps there's going to be some issues in the future. Perhaps we think the economy is not going to be as strong and we think that the government is going to reduce interest rates. Perhaps we're very fearful. Maybe we're very fearful and we think we want that 3%, we want it locked in for 10 years, maybe even the 30 year, whatever the rate might be. We want it locked in for 30 years because we're frightful of what's gonna happen in the markets. So these are kind of the things that people take into, that people are thinking about. And when they see that yield curve flattening, they get a little bit worried. Now, to me, do I think this is really indicative? Not particularly. I mean, this thing could flatten over you know months, days, maybe years. It could be another five years, 10 years before it goes flat. You don't know, right? But it's definitely been shifting, and that's definitely related to the 
related to the Fed rates. The last thing that we see here is trade. We've seen all the rhetoric. I mean, you know, there's been a lot that, uh, you know, President Trump has done, done good for the economy. You know, the corporate inversions, bringing uh, cash back, lowering the corporate tax rate. And there's been a lot of exuberance in the market about that. The stock market's been skyrocketing. And I think part of the issue is, is kind of like, what's next? You know, the Fed is raising the interest rates. What's the next, you know, trick in Trump's sleeves to keep that market going? We saw a hot, hot market last year. The Dow was up nearly 30% if you include dividends. Uh, the S&P 500 was up something like 22%, somewhere around there. Um, and now we have this trade looming over our head, right? So you're seeing that, especially in the tech sector, because of protect, uh, potential tariffs and whatnot, really um, creating a lot of uncertainty in the market as we don't know what's gonna happen. Now, when you combine these three things, that's a recipe for some volatility in the market, and that's what we've been seeing. And it is definitely concerning somewhat, but it should be taken into perspective, like what I just said. What has happened over the last couple of years? I mean, we're in the, lo we're in the longest bull market of you know, history, right? If you can't expect these kind of these drops in the market, I mean, you shouldn't be in, frankly, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. If anybody tells you they know what's going to happen, they're lying. But there's always these types of lessons that come into the market that make you think, well, maybe I should be a little bit more protected. What should I do? Even myself, I get a little too comfortable sometimes and think, hey, my market, you know, my 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 portfolio is doing good. It's going to continue to do good. That's just human nature. We think that's going to happen, but it's not necessarily always the case. So uh, there's kind of a, a couple different things I wanted to say, and this is kind of how I rebalance my portfolio. Again, this is just my recommendation. I don't know you. I don't know your personal situation. I mean, always do your research. Don't do exactly what I say. Um, but there's a couple different options. One of the different one of the options is to try to time the market. This is generally speaking not a good idea. You get out. People were looking at this yield curve flattening a long time ago. I might have got out of the market. Look at the loss, you know, not the loss, but look at the, you know, the opportunity cost. Look how much they have actually given up in terms of the market, just on a tear, right? So, you know, there's that option. And the, and the other option is just to hold and just, you know, hold through the, the recession. And if it happens, of course, and long-term hold will always be your best, you know, your best bet. And I tend to believe in that philosophy. However, I do believe that you can augment your portfolio just a little bit. And I've done these certain things, and this might be something that you might want to think of too. So the first play that I, I went into is high dividends. Like, so we'll call this little section stocks. We'll call it maybe like high yield. So I start to look for stocks that if we do see a recession and I'm stuck with that equity, I'm stuck with that stock for long term, I want something that's gonna be paying me money, right? Like I wanna be getting some money in. Like I don't wanna be in a Tesla that's gonna tank. You know, maybe Tesla's gonna do good in 20, 30 years. Who knows, maybe you're super bullish on it, but you, you, you're stuck in a recession. These types of volatile stocks, these, um, especially these, some of these speculative stocks are gonna tank. So I mean, we've looked lately, these are just approximate. We have IBM, Verizon, AT&T, Ford, Procter & Gamble. Like I like to look at some of the inferior goods. So things that people buy even in a recession. So like Procter & Gamble, it pays three and a half percent on its dividend. So maybe look at this company and start thinking to yourself, well, is that a good back to it? You know, do I think that's a good valuation? Everything's probably gonna fall if there's a recession, but it's likely that these high yielding dividend stocks are gonna fall less. Ford is crazy today. I mean, Ford's kind of blowing my mind. Like I, I know a lot of this is with the, the trade tariffs. Um, and I know a lot of it has to do with some of the uncertainty with the CEO and stuff like that, but it's dividends almost like 7%. So if you're fearful of what's going on and you just wanna lock in 7%, no matter what happens with the underlying equity, um, you're gonna have a huge, huge yield. Of course, there's some risk with that. And then you have these staples in the states like AT&T and Verizon, IBM, they're like 5%, 4%, 4%. You know, they're, they're pretty good, right? And there's plenty of those, and there's even ones that are a little bit more high risky. Like there's one, uh, I believe the ticker's HCLP, High Crush Partners, and it's something like 28% right now. If you look into that company, it's actually a good company to look into. It's paying, you know, nearly 30% on its dividend, and I believe it has the ability to pay that out for quite some time, right? So, let's take a, this off the board here, we'll leave this. So one of the strategies is to go into high yield, right? Okay, you know, another strategy is, like I said, you could just go straight cash. I don't recommend that, but I do recommend pulling back some cash. And what I mean by that is, if the recession hit tomorrow and it was here for 10 years, would you be able to survive on just your, you know, your income, on your net income, you know, every year? 
um, you need to be start looking more like that. You know, some people want 10%, some people want 20%. Maybe you should think about upping this right now. Maybe this is just a time to, you know, not be concerned, but really start thinking, hey, maybe I should be holding a lot more cash. We've been in the bull market, a really raging bull market for a really uh, long period of time. Another strategy, if you're kind of more on the aggressive, is I'll call it like the aggressive, uh, if I can even write this, aggressive ETF approach. Now I call this more like insurance. What I've done with my portfolio, and I'm a good example because I did this quite some time ago, is I bought what I would call an insurance policy, right? I bought uh, a couple on Canadian and US inverse market ETFs. Now I want to make this clear that I did not buy leveraged inverse market ETFs because the longer term you hold those, I won't go into those, but if you'd like me to in a video, I will. Uh, the longer you hold those, the more that they lose value. Now my inverse market ETFs have been losing value because the market has been going up. As the market goes up and up and up, let's pretend this is my inverse market ETF, it's proportionately going down, down, down. And it's not leveraged, so it's going in tandem essentially. I mean, all things remaining equal. Now, what that's doing is it's dragging, you know, my whole portfolio down, but I have a very small proportion in there. I might have like 5%, I'd have to look, something like that. And I don't worry about it so much because, you know, if this whole stock market goes up and I have 95% of my portfolio in, um, you know, just the broad market, then I'm doing good and I don't really care about this so much. But I see this as an insurance policy. We saw an 800 point drop today in the Dow. And what if we're seeing thousands or more? You're gonna see the complete opposite. You're gonna see your inverse market ETF skyrocket, and then hopefully, not as much, you know, if you, you've taken heed of these other things, your other portfolio will drop as well. Um, but at least this gives you an option to now say, okay, so I have, you know, this higher proportion of my portfolio now is in this e uh, inverse market ETF. Yes, I have cash, but I could sell this if need be for cash. And the more the market tanks, the more it becomes worth, right? So I think it's really important to have something like this. It's kind of, it's, it's just, it's what they would call in finance a hedge. I mean, you can hedge with uh, options, you can hedge with, you know, puts, stuff like that. But what I don't like about that, if you have any uh, expertise in those, is that they have expiry dates. We don't know, you know, when the market crash is gonna be. We don't know if it's gonna be another five years. We don't know because there's gotta be, a, you know, there's gotta be a reason for it, generally speaking. And that's kind of one or where I wanted to leave, leave off with this is that you gotta think of this logically. It's, it's kind of like one of these things that people think about, they're like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But generally speaking, there has to be a reasons for it. We're seeing spooks in the market because of this types of stuff, but I, none of it is big enough right now to cause a market crash. You're just seeing the fact that markets have been up so much and now we're seeing some uncertainty, right? But quite often it's, it's you know, it might be this fourth event right here, which we don't know what it is. It could be a big event, event. it could be an all out trade war, it could be something else, right? And generally it's that which pulls you into something like a market crash, right? And even in that situation, these, and I'm sorry about my board getting really messy, is these strategies that I've outlined at least make you a little bit prepared. You can never be prepared. If you're in the market, you're making money, you're gonna have risks associated with that. You're gonna have it, right? But the key is long-term investing, guys, long-term, right? That's what this whole channel is about. It's called value venture investing. It's, it's looking for value, you know, and venturing out, <laughs> finding that value, venturing out and holding long-term value investing, right? With little bits of, you know, tips and stocks we can hold for short term here and there, but the majority of the portfolio holding over long periods of time, on average 10% a year, I did another video on this as well, um, showing you guys those returns, will, make you very wealthy over a long period of time. If you're in your 20s, if you're in your 30s, or even your early 30s, you can do very well. But don't let these types of things scare you to the point where you sell, or uh, you know you do something reckless or whatever, right? You gotta keep the end goal in mind, you gotta protect yourself as much as you can, and you gotta take things into perspective. So it's kind of a little bit, this video has been kind of a little bit of a mix between what's going on, what I think you should be doing, just my opinion by the way, um, and you know a little bit of market philosophy. So we'll see what happens in the market. I think it's gonna remain kind of turbulent for quite some time now, I hope. Um, I hope that things kind of find their way back to normal, but I'm not expecting it right now. We've seen phenomenal last couple of years and we might just see the market fall back a little bit more. We'll have to see.
Anyway, that's going to be it for today, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.